Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, this is Lorna Lyons, and I am welcoming you to uh, what promises to be a great event. Um, we actually have a lot of folks registered, so we're going to tap dance for a few minutes here um, just to make sure everyone can get in and uh, hear the bios of our great presenters, et cetera, period. Oops, sorry, <laughs> bad habit. So um, I am moderator for tonight, Lorna Lyons. I'm also the um, regional co-lead for the U.S. Hemp Building Association here in Oregon, along with Stephanie Luciano, who's also on our on, at this event. Um, and this is our first webinar for uh, USHBA, or the Oregon Hub has not gotten it together yet and here we are and we're so pleased that you can all make it um, and particularly the willingness of our busy speakers to agree to be here. Um, it's our intention to hold one of these every couple of months so I hope you'll um, check back at USHBA's event calendar and um, visit again. Um, I, while we're waiting here, I wanted to just see if I can also um, just give you a little bit of housekeeping that um, what the plan for the evening is actually that I'm going to introduce both of our speakers in, sequ in sequence initially. Each of them is going to speak for 20 minutes. And then after they've both spoken, they will handle questions from all of us. Uh, you know, as dependent upon who it's addressed to, they'll just manage that. So my housekeeping suggestion is that there is a Q&A panel here for you to go ahead and um, ask, you know, ask a question as it arises in your mind, because they're just going to keep going and give you more and more information. And then we'll stop after 40 minutes or so and begin to address questions. So there's that piece. And then otherwise, I just wanted to kind of introduce USHBA. I'll do more of that at the end where I'll do an actual invitation to join us. But uh, for just right now, I just want to mention that our mission statement is um, that the USHBA is here to support an advocate for hemp building professionals, projects, and materials in the United States. Uh, and we also have a screen here for what we work on, uh, which if, yes, great. Um, so our goals and objectives uh, is to be resource for developers, designers, builders, improve the sustainability and quality of homes and commercial buildings, to provide education and best practices for projects incorporating hemp-based building materials, and to establish specifications and suggestions for quality control. And then we also do fundraising for our, uh, our US Hemp Building Association Foundation, which is moving toward, is, an, is a tax, I can't remember the tax exempt status, but it's an, it allows us to, uh, to gather funds to try to work primarily initially toward certification. Um, which is one of the things that John Simonton is going to speak to. John Simonson, excuse me. So I think, oh, that was, that was what it is. Yes, so I think we just saw it pop into the screen. It's a 501c3, so thank you. Um, so I think if our speakers will, they'll be joining us, but I'm going to go ahead and begin, um, I think, uh, just, just giving you the bios, which are extensive, of our great speakers uh, for this evening. Um, so Jeffrey Steiner is going to speak first. And he received his, there he is, he <laughs> received his PhD from Oregon State University, right here, in seed production and technology, and his BS and MS from California State Fresno. Um, he's the Associate Director of the Oregon State University Global Hemp Innovation Center, which will be GHIC from here on. The GHIC is home to leading world experts in hemp research and is the largest of its kind in the nation. 
The center works to advance hemp and its marketing potential through innovation across all aspects of supply chains involving researchers from multiple disciplines who partner with industry sectors to help solve challenges to meeting the growing demand for food, fiber, essential oils, and other products made from hemp, aka herd. <laughs> Um, so Mr. Steiner is so well positioned because he has a broad leadership experience in government and academic settings, conducting and administering research in food and agriculture, natural resources and bioenergy systems. After several years focused on hemp at the US Department of Agriculture, we are grateful he's focused his expertise on the hemp industry here at OSU and he will be speaking about developing and sourcing hemp. Um, but then, as I said, immediately after, he'll be directly followed by Professor John Simonson, who is in the Department of Wood Science and Engineering at OSU. He received his PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Colorado in 1975. And after a decade plus of working with businesses in the chemistry industry, he joined the faculty of Oregon State University in the Department of Forest Products in 1990. He's presently a professor in the Department of Wood Science and Engineering, the OSU Materials Science Program, and holds graduate status in the Department of Chemical Engineering. And I have to mention, as an alumni of this great course, he was, I didn't know this until I saw the bio, he was a co-creator of the nation's first four-credit college course on hemp, known as Wood Science and Engineering, WSE 266, Industrial Hemp. It's virtual and open to non-enrolled folks as well, and it's a wonderful course. So Dr. Simonson's research interests include cellulose chemistry, especially cellulose nanomaterials, and polymer composites, including natural fiber polymer composites, biopolymers, and for the last three years, he's been focused on hemp, hemp processing, and hemp chemistry. He will be speaking about establishing standard testing for certification. From my point of view, one of the most important balls that the US Hemp Building Association is committed to moving to the goalpost is getting hemp biomass ASTM certified so that hemp can begin to be used at scale in building projects. And I'm glad Mr. Simonson is a member of USHBA and is working with our certification committee. So as I turn things over to our speakers, I will remind you that if you have questions during their presentations, please type them in to the Q&A section and we will answer them after both have spoken. So I'm pleased to introduce Jeffrey Steiner, followed by John Simonson. Hey, thanks a lot, Lorna. And let me get this on projection. Here we go. Uh, John, I just really appreciate the invitation uh, to speak before your group. Um, uh, as you see, it's going to be a two-part presentation. I'm going to give kind of a little bit of background about uh, the Global Hemp Innovation Center and then talking about the sourcing and development of hemp, how it relates to egg systems and fitting into American agriculture. You know, one of the big factors to realize is that, you know, over the better than the last past century, there's been a huge increase in productivity in agriculture. Um, but the shame about all this is that uh, beginning with the Marijuana Tax Act, um, basically what happened was that hemp was legislated out of its ability to be grown in American agriculture. So hemp during this 80 year period between when uh, uh, the Marijuana Tax Act was enacted and when uh, the Farm Bill of 2014-18 were implemented, hemp missed out on all of the science and innovation that happened during this time. It's at this point now with uh, the release of uh, hemp back into the marketplace uh, that we're having to try to do some real catch up. Um, as you all know, uh, hemp has, is a very versatile crop, has many, many uses. Uh, the main um, uh, commodity classes of it are for grain, for whole plant, for extracts, and for stocks that can go into materials. And thinking about the type of uh, 
modern now, a lot different than 80 years ago type of products that are made or can be made from hemp. We think about high performance textiles, composites, building materials, manufactured wood. I see Greg Wilson's out there in the audience. Uh, that's a picture of his product. Uh, personal care products, uh, also uh, advanced materials such as a, a, a graphite uh, replacement for making graphene, for making batteries, uh, high performance capacitors. Going into pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals for flavors, aromas, for uh, fundamental proteins and triglycerides, similar to soybean or canola, uh, crops such as that. And even has uh, expression as a flavoring in a, in a beer that's manufactured in Fort Collins, Colorado. The point to it though, is that uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty with the market and uh, the, the, the oversight, the regulation of some of these products. And so there's things that are putting a drag on the market to this place. Uh, supply chain in particular is what really affects building materials made from hemp. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. But again, there's an increasing commitment to bio-based economies. And so hemp uh, really poses a lot of great possibilities for imagination on where uh, products can be made and particularly in replacement of petroleum-based materials. Now, OSU, Oregon State University has a long history with hemp. It too is interrupted uh, by the, the pause since 1937. Uh, in the uh, late 1800s, uh, up until uh, hemp and the, uh, uh, the marijuana tax uh, came into play, uh, was a co-partner with USDA for the National Hemp Research Program, located in Corvallis, paired up with what was happening in Washington, DC. There were brief periods when uh, there were uh, gaps in the slats of the floor so that hemp could be worked on. But again, with the uh, enactment of the 14 and 18 Farm Bill, and particularly the 18 Farm Bill that the Global Hemp Innovation Center uh, was formally announced at Oregon State University. And so Oregon State jumped both feet back into the pond of uh, working with hemp. Uh, at present, there are six colleges at Oregon State, uh, range from pharmacy, engineering, uh, business, agriculture, science, and so forth. Uh, we have over 50 faculty that are affiliated with the center and we're organized around industry sectors, uh, particularly looking and working on developing private public partnerships, uh, particularly for our goal setting. And the reason for this is how can we then accelerate all the science innovation that's gone into other commodities and apply that now to hemp today so that we can move forward. And in the case of uh, your group, one of our uh, consortium uh, areas is in digital architecture and construction. John's the leader of that part. Okay, we're Global Hemp Innovation in, uh, Center. Global, part of our name, is not just aspirational but actual. As I mentioned, the Hemp Center was not launched on campus until 2019. That's when we were able to get past the legal barriers of doing so. But Jay Noller, the founding director of the center, had already established partnerships four years earlier in Serbia and a couple of years uh, after that in China. Uh, so uh, while we could not grow hemp uh, on university facilities uh, until 2019, we already were doing work in Serbia and China. And since that time, we now uh, have been doing research around our various research centers around the state. We've also developed partnerships with the Imperial Valley Conservation Research Center for winter nursery research in Southern California near the Mexico border. And we've also have partnerships with Alabama A&M and with Colorado State University Pueblo, which are minority serving institutions. Uh, again, helping uh, them develop our talent, us their talent and making partnerships uh, uh, that much stronger. We also partner with other land grant universities around the United States. And uh, this past year, before COVID, we expanded our research in Romania and Bulgaria as well. So this shows the, the global footprint of the Hemp Center and where we're working and who we're working with. Okay, so for our conversation today, uh, the Hemp Building Update, I'm gonna focus now on hemp development and sourcing, uh, particularly looking at how do you discover the optimal place for hemp in the American landscape. Um, first point to remember is that, you know, a vast majority of the hemp that is grown in the United States 
is grown for essential oils, particularly for cannabinoids such as CBD. And the commercial system, as you see out there like this, this field, is not that far from a typical cannabis grow that would have been in somebody's basement or a, a greenhouse or out in the woods before the uh, uh, decriminalization of hemp uh, by the farm bill. And the thing that point I wanna make here is that it's a long ways from uh, the type of culture that's used even in uh, expanded production such as this for CBD to go to uh, a custom fiber uh, system such as grown in, in uh, Europe, as you can see already there. And then moving into large scaled production, uh, say on par with cotton, with a cotton, modern cotton gin, where in the United States, uh, we have about 550 cotton gins and on average, they process uh, 40, 500 pound bales per hour. Uh, over a 90 day season, we'll process 40,000 bales, which equates to 20 million pounds of lint per year. And so when you consider where we're at right now with uh, hemp fiber, it's a long ways to go to get to scale to the type of production that we see with cotton, which can actually then have a huge uh, impact on the market or a dent into the marketplace. Now going again, back up to uh, uh, essential oil hemp, CBD type uh, hemp, uh, there is a genetic by environment by management effect uh, on the productivity of hemp. Uh, what's, this is one example from one company that grows in Oregon, Colorado, Kentucky, I think in North Carolina as well. And uh, basically finding the natural environment in Oregon for growing uh, essential oil type hemp is actually more productive than is in Colorado or Kentucky. Uh, Colorado more productive than Kentucky as well. Um, but we don't have a real good handle on how do the genetics then fit in across the country. And so beginning in 2020, we uh, started a national network, trial network of looking at essential oil standard varieties grown across these locations with our partner land grant universities uh, across the country. And that work is continuing in this, this year as well. But what we're finding is that with the genetics of these uh, uh, CBD, cannabinoid type, essential oil varieties, uh, that they were primarily developed in northern latitudes, and they're not as well adapted as you go to uh, shorter day lengths going into southern latitudes. And then throwing in a lot of other abiotic factors and some biotic factors, uh, the standard varieties off the shelf, you know, are just uh, a lot of work is going into now developing varieties that are more suited to these southern latitudes. If we think about grain hemp, presently Montana leads the United States in grain hemp production and, uh, uh, and that is expanding. Uh, also in North Dakota, Minnesota, state of Washington. And uh, what you're looking at then is a, a crop uh, grown for the, uh, the seed, the grain. It's a dioecious uh, male and female plants to do that. And uh, um, that then, you know, is providing a, another source of a type of, uh, of hemp that can be grown in American agriculture and those details are being worked out. However, it's the same point where it has not been extensive work looking at the genetics and how they interact with the environment and the management effects. Uh, our partner institution, University of Kentucky, uh, is leading a program looking at uh, grain hemp, uh, actually by crop grain, dual fiber, uh, hemp varieties, and seeing how they produce. Um, but the point to be made here is that when we start thinking about fiber crops, the initial foray into uh, fiber production in the United States is really looking at a dual crop uh, where the grain is harvested and then the stems are utilized to extract the fiber from them. Um, that's not an optimal system from what we understand, uh, knowing how the European systems work, also in China. Uh, the grain actually matures later than the optimal time of the fiber, which is earlier in the season uh, by several weeks. Um, but what, uh, again, it's then how do we start to look forward to say, what, uh, what, what would a, actually a dedicated fiber industry look like uh, in the United States? Uh, the big drawback to that, and we'll go a little bit more details in a second of that, is, is infrastructure. 
And by being able to grow both grain and fiber at the same time, there's two economic returns that can come from that same plant on the same piece of ground. And so that's really how, how it has to be uh, looked at is, you know, how can you get optimal return from your crop uh, rather than just as a specialty crop as it is right now without the infrastructure. By the way, the red dots on here, you know, just going through Google and searching uh, the different state names and uh, where there's desires or efforts in, in fiber production. These are all the states across the United States, you know, that there's some declared or uh, 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 motion forward for growing uh, fiber in these states. Again, what's important to think about is, well, then where is the optimal place to grow the fiber, to grow the grain? How does that fit, you know, across the entire country? Uh, those are details that, again, have to be worked out by research. Okay, now it's not just a matter of where can hemp grow and how can you optimally grow it, but where does it start to fit into the existing uh, agricultural systems that are already present? The United States is a very diverse agricultural crop. It's broken down by these regions, and these are the major commodities that are grown across the United States uh, adapted to different regions. So any consideration of hemp now has to be, well, how does hemp then complement uh, the existing agriculture that already exists in the United States? And so what it really is a matter, and here's an example from the Pacific, Pacific Northwest, in the past several years, as hemp started to ramp up in acres, uh, there were conflicts with potatoes and alfalfa production. And uh, at the same time, it was viewed that there's real advantages to growing hemp on these grounds, you know, which can help improve water quality. Hemp is a very good scavenger of nutrients, uh, uh, can keep nutrients from leaching through the soil. And so it really gets to be a matter then of, okay, how can hemp then be incorporated into existing potato or alfalfa or other cropping systems? And so it's really a matter of then looking at a integrated production system and thinking about hemp as a substitution or rotation crop that can fit with other crops. Um, in the long run, that is the way all, all crop production works uh, as insects build up diseases and so forth it's gonna be very necessary for hemp to be rotated. And so thinking again about the existing agriculture, bringing in hemp, how can that then work uh, moving forward? Okay, now let's get a little more specific about, you know, okay, now how do we optimize hemp component within a system? I've already mentioned that there's various market classes and these products that could be made from hemp. And uh, those are very, very different base materials. And so thinking about especially grain, biomass or a fiber crop, uh, the development of specific varieties and cultural production practices that would optimize those. Uh, and thinking specifically then, as this group is interested in bast for, uh, for fabric, for herd, for, for hempcrete, for construction, you know, you then have to think about this entire different system than this adapted uh, former marijuana system, you know, with wide plant spacings. You know, in Serbia, uh, we found that the optimal density for fiber plants is 240 plants per meter. In China, 180 plants per meter. Um, but that's just talking about how to get the maximum fiber out of the crop. Uh, understanding then is how do we, uh, uh, you know, push towards the value of, or the, the higher value uh, 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 bass fibers versus the herd, or is there a way to produce uh, very large volumes of herd in certain production configurations? All that needs to be worked out. Uh, again, how, you know, how can you come up with a, a product, a material, then that's able to be competitive with other materials that are on the market? Uh, to address this and kind of tying again the issue about the, uh, the fiber crops or the, the genetics of the crops and where the materials came from, uh, Oregon State has a partnership with the University of California Davis and Washington State University and the Agriculture Research Service, where we're just going back to the fundamental genetics of these different market classes and looking at what can be done uh, to really broaden the germplasm uh, base that's there. And then how do those start to fit into various production regions, you know, particularly in the West as well as around the country. Uh, again, it's this look at this genetic by environment interaction and how market classes can be optimized by that. And again, it all comes down to really uh, supply chains. Uh, uh, and, you know, it's, it's not just any one of these pieces, 
but with the entire supply chain, if any one of these components is not able to stand and be economic, be economical, the entire supply chain falls. So it's really a matter then, not only think about the sustainable incorporation of the crop by itself, you know, into a landscape, into a production system, but it's thinking about how does that then feed into the specific materials that are needed for manufacturing and making of products, the markets that'll pull on that. How do the genetics be brought together to optimize this production system uh, and this supply chain? And thinking about the entire economic development of a region of how all these parts come together, uh, not only for production, but utilization, marketing, uh, the finance to set, uh, to set up the facilities that are necessary to make uh, high value products. You know, these are all the considerations that have to be given as you start to think about how does hemp start to fit out there. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to John and John's gonna really focus down on things that you guys are really interested in. Thank you, Jeff. And Hmm. So one of the issues with that the uh, USHVA is interested in <clears throat> is hempcrete, and the it's really hot. There's a lot of things that you can make out of hemp herd. People have made particle board. They've made something similar to OSB. Um, and then we have Greg Wilson is making hemp boards for flooring to replace oak flooring. So there's a variety of different building products that can be made out of hemp. But it seems that from the information that I've received, it seems to me that uh, there's a really big interest in getting hempcrete into building codes and into specifications to market. Right? So Lauren has already done a lot of giving the introduction here. So then there's um, Or, you know, if, if, if hempcrete was just another insulation material like um, cellulose bats or polystyrene foam, the pink, pink panther stuff, uh, it would be pretty straightforward to get it into standards. But hemp is not like that. Hempcrete is an excellent insulation material, but it um, operates differently than the other insulation materials in the market and in, is breathable. It doesn't need a vapor barrier and uh, it improves the living quality of the interior of the building. <clears throat> but because of that, the standards that we have today don't apply to hempcrete. So to build out of hempcrete and then put a vapor barrier on it is just kind of crazy. So we don't want to do that. And so there's uh, the USHVA has an important and serious effort to correct this issue so that the market can increase and that we can all do more. Right now, one of the big problems is the supply chain. And Jeff kind of touched on this a little bit, but from my interactions with people in the business, uh, getting a reliable, consistent, reproducible supply of hemp herd to make hempcrete out of is a real issue. And I can't really talk to that. That's a big issue. And it's kind of not within my wheelhouse, my uh, area of expertise. So the but one way, one way to start with this is to make some standards and so that these builders and other people can understand what they're getting, they can specify and have those specifications met by the marketplace. So some of the issues here is 
you know, if you, if you read the literature, if you talk to people, they'll tell you that hempcrete has an if you make the, if you change the size of the herd when you make the hempcrete, is it still 2.4, right? Uh, is the hempcrete dry or what if people sell it before, it's, what if people build the building before it's dry, how long will it take it to dry? Um, what is the orientation of the particles in the hempcrete? Because they're not spheres, they're not round, right? They're oblong. And are they random? Are they aligned? And what difference does that make to the porosity, to the density, to the R value? Um, <clears throat> how long does it take to cure? That depends on the binder. And what is the particle size distribution, et cetera, et cetera. And then the binder can also change. Um, to my knowledge, most people are using, there's one favorite, it seems, kind of binder, but there's other, there's a, several binders on the market and new ones coming all the time and, um, and research going on to come up with new binders. Um, so you also have, of course, when you make hempcrete, I imagine everyone knows this, you need hemp herd, you need binder, you need water. But what are the exact ratios given your uh, various components? And I apologize, if people are seeing uh, your internet connection is unstable, that's because I live out on a farm where I'm growing hemp, or we're getting ready to grow it this season, we're germinating right now. And um, I only have DSL for my computer out here. So. It is unstable, to say the least. Okay, so then, given all that, when you finally do make the hempcrete, if you buy hempcrete from different manufacturers, do they, does it have the same strength, the same stiffness, the same compressibility, which is how high can you stack it before you get into trouble? And I haven't heard anybody talk about creep. What does this stuff do over time? I think. It's all right, but I think it also depends upon the binder. If the binder's not correctly made, are you going to get creep over time? Which would be not a good thing. Another more issues. <clears throat> Hempcrete is um, not is susceptible to liquid water. It's kind of like Gore-Tex. It's not like, it's not Gore-Tex, but it's kind of like Gore-Tex in that it's porous and uh, to water vapor. But liquid water, if you get enough of it, can penetrate and that can change your insulation values and it can also make it swell, make, make it crack, and it's a problem. So you need to coat the hempcrete with something. What you coat it with is going to have an effect Perhaps on the mechanical properties, I don't know that anybody's got any numbers on that. It's definitely going to have an effect on the porosity. It maybe have an effect on the thermal performance. I mean, it should. If it affects the porosity, it's going to affect the thermal performance because the thermal performance depends upon, um, well, you have heat conduction, heat convection, and heat radiation. So you have those three different forms of heat transfer. And the coating can affect one or more of those. Okay, and of course, water resistance. If the coating isn't keeping the hemp dry when it gets hit with rain, um, then that's a problem too. Okay, so to address all these issues, uh, we're going to have to do some testing. And so the rest of my talk is going to be talking about, I suppose this is kind of an advertisement, but I also intend for it to be uh, educational in and informative in terms of what a university can do to help. And it's not just OSU, most universities are gonna have the <clears throat> similar equipment to what we have with, with one exception, which I'm saving for the last. And uh, so we're, you need to test uh, mechanical testing, Strength to show you pictures and videos of some of the equipment that we have, uh, testing to determine the R value, accelerated aging, how is the material, how is the, you have a hempcrete wall with a coating and it's exposed outdoors. What's going to happen to it over time? And how can we learn about that quickly 
sooner than just waiting 10 years. Right? So, and the overall environmental performance, of course, is important. <clears throat> so the first one is thermal resistance system. And this measures the R value, the, the heat conduction, and a variety of different parameters related to heat in this video. The machine itself is in chemical engineering. John, there are comments. It looks well, as if that running that kicked you off for a moment. Uh, but we're having a hard time hearing her. So either you perhaps need to narrate. Okay. Or... Well, yeah. okay, that's probably gonna be true for a lot of the videos. So I apologize for my internet connection. I'm sorry. So, um, well, we'll see if this one works a little bit. So measuring compressive strength and stiffness is a straightforward thing to do with concrete. You can also, also measure flexural strength. And as I mentioned, Crete, and this is a video of measuring. I'm, I'm gonna talk over what's going on here. So this is a, this is a sample. I, I teach a class and we make concrete in class and I hit it with a blowtorch to show people that it doesn't burn at all. And so that we're going to, uh, now we're going to put it in this device. <clears throat> so this is a mechanical tester, universal, universal mechanical testing machine. We have plates, we can make different sizes. Well, we can follow you. That's um, going to uh, shorten yeah, my. Yeah, you're just being bounced out occasionally, but we can still hear you. So we're just going to look at these pictures. Okay. So the um, so this machine can be raised up, and it can be lowered, and it measures the force and the distance. And from that, you can measure strength, stiffness. And to do creep is a different matter. To do creep, oh, we would, what we would do is we would build a, a wall or a, even a single block or better yet, a wall of some kind, a small one, and put weight on the top and then instrument it so that we can measure the distance. And so we know the weight, we know the distance, and we can then make a chart for creep to see if the material creeps over time. I don't think that's going to be a problem with hempcrete, but I don't think anybody's actually got numbers on it. OK, so another test is accelerated aging. aging and we can do this a couple of different ways. So this is a video that I'm not going to play. And this is a, called the QUV machine. And it, um, <clears throat> well, let me see if I can just do this real quick there so um the if you it's hard to see but these things in here are uh, fluorescent tubes so you can 
get fluorescent tubes and they can be grow lights. So you have UV or it can be daylight tubes. So you have sun exposure and you have the, you put the sample in here, the rings hold it down and you have a little window that then exposes it to the sun. You can use to, the machine also has misters in it. So you can basically generate fog inside and you can also control the temperature. So this is accelerated aging. Typically a thousand hours in this machine is equal to one year in the outdoor environment. This machine is used uh, very routinely in the paint industry and other kinds of industries where you have siding, exterior exposure of all different kinds. Okay, another uh, instrument that's available, but I don't know that it's, I don't know how important it is to get this value, but it's something that we can do at OSU is this is an instrumented impact tester. So the actual tester itself is it's probably hard to see, but you have a, there's a little nose that comes down here that has a blunt, it's kind of a blunt object, right? And you can raise it up and it's got, a, you can change the weight, it has a specific weight and you drop it onto the sample. So the sample goes down here. And you can put notches in the sample or there's a variety of different ways to test impact. This particular machine um, has electronics in it that measure in, on the, in the realm, time realm of microseconds. I really need to be. We've got you again. At work to do this. Okay. <clears throat> so, okay. Sorry. Um, so, you can actually watch, watch the material break as it is impacted. And I think this perhaps has, uh, may have some utility down the line for handling and the toughness of the hempcrete. As we as the technology develops, because right now, in my humble opinion, I think hempcrete technology is in the baby phase, and I think we're going to see much improved hempcrete as time goes by. Okay, last but not least is our MECMEC, <clears throat> stands for Multi Chamber Modular Environmental Conditioning System, but nobody says that. We all call it the MECMEC. And this has three different chambers here. You can see one, two, three down here on the end. And if you look <clears throat> closely here, you can see that there's, um, you can see this panel. And this panel actually is a wall. So these chambers are on sliders. They can slide apart. We have a crane to move these walls in and out. So you can actually build a wall and put it inside the chamber and uh, lock it down. <clears throat> and then you can, for example, put interior conditions in one panel, in one room, one chamber, and exterior conditions in the other. You can control the temperature, you can control the relative humidity, and you can control light. And you can cycle it as you wish, you can program it, it's all programmable. And it, of course, records everything. So you can measure um, <clears throat> all the material, all the environmental properties that you want through this um, by using MEC here. So this is really our, and there aren't very many of these in the country. And so this would really be an excellent way to build a hempcrete wall and actually see the performance over time. And, by um, <clears throat> putting it in there, pardon my cat, by putting it in here um, for a long period of time, several weeks or a month, um, you can get accelerated aging with this device also. And I put the cost down here. So I think this is significantly low in fact, I think these, all of these test methods will be significantly lower 
than using uh, third party testing agencies or testing companies. OSU is a, <clears throat> is a university, it's a land grant university. So we are forbidden from competing with private enterprise, but we can do research. So you can, you can get the numbers that you need. You can do the research here when you want to change your formulation, see which one is best and all of that. You can do it at the university at a much lower cost. Then we've got everything ready. You can take it to your third party tester and <clears throat> get all the official data that you need, ISO 9000 and all that stuff. Uh, to go to the building codes and ASTM and wherever. So, <clears throat> and then if you need electron micros microscopy, we have really super good electron microscopy at OSU. Um, we can go from looking at things the size that, a, that you would use an optical microscope for right down to looking at almost molecules. So we've got 10 minutes for questions. Lauren? Uh, here we are. Um, thank you. Uh, that are people was not hearing me. Uh, no, we were hearing you fine. We, I just didn't see the question slide, so I hadn't popped back on. But you were you were audible, and that was great. Um, and oh, okay. so let me just uh, see if Jeffrey wants to come back in, and we'll begin to start answering questions. Um, I think I'll start from the bottom because John, we just had a question right away from Katrina Nguyen saying, how can I learn more about the MECMAC and a possibly visit? Can you hear us, John? Did you freeze? Uh, that's easy. Um, give me an email. Give me. A... Yeah, I'm unstable. <laughs> right. Um, Metaphysics stop sharing. So <clears throat> shoot me an email, give me a phone call. Okay. Yeah. And maybe you could put those two in the chat so that people would have access to it. Is that all right? Or would you prefer not? Sure. Uh, it, it, it was on online, it was easy to find your contact information. Um, all right, well, there's my email. That's the best way to, that's the best way to reach me, actually. Okay, wonderful. All right, well, let me, uh, sorry, let me move back to the next question, um, which is uh, by Michael, has anyone tested a natural style cork paint as a coating to protect the hempcrete? And if so, how did that affect the properties of hempcrete? I haven't seen that or heard of it. Jeff, have you? No, no familiarity at all, John. It's, it's actually interesting. Uh, Stephanie, uh, my cohort just recently discovered it and it's 80% cork and the rest is paint resin but it has wonderful properties, thermal properties, and sort of, it's very interesting, very intriguing material. Um, but that's, yeah. that's, that's why I said, sorry. Go that's ahead. That's why I said, I think hempcrete technology is in the baby phase. Yes. I think we're gonna see new binders, new coatings, new um, particle size distributions. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of advancement in hempcrete technology over the next few years. Okay, um, we, have a, we have a comment from Maria Montes de Orca saying, thank you, I will do some research. I'm not quite clear what that's in reference to. Um, then I'm gonna move down. How is it that hemp houses built a long time ago in other countries are still standing strong and there are not these high-tech testing machines available? Uh. 
Well, because there were probably a lot of hemp houses in ancient times that didn't work. But over time, people figured out how to do it. They right. didn't have a prohibition against growing hemp. <laughs> so right. they had all the hemp they needed and they could, they could test it uh, as often as they wanted to. So I think it's mostly trial and error. Right, exactly. And it's a- and We're trying know, to shorten that uh, time scale. Precisely, we're in a very different circumstance, right? Um, so D. Van Eck wants to know what dimensions of a sample wall are needed to be able to test the MUMEC or the MVMEC. So the, how large are McMech, those walls? The McMech is eight feet by eight feet. Great. So you, can, you can have a wall up to, probably not up to, it's probably a little bit less than that because you know it needs to be in that frame. Sit with, within that box, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that seemed incredibly valuable to get information from that. Um, all right, I'm not seeing other questions here. Let me sort of move through what's been answered to see where we are. Um, so somebody's asking for non-students being involved in research and Jeffrey said, send an email. Oh yes, and this issue of genetics, I feel like everybody's probably interested in this one, uh, Jeffrey. So do you wanna to speak to that for a moment? Yeah, sure, Lorna. You know, the whole, let me just back, let me see if I can back up. To, well, maybe I'm not gonna be able to. Um, what the issue is, is that, um, here, let me put a picture back up again. You know, the, what, what the issue is about is that, um, um, oh, I see the problem. I'm wasting my time by trying to get this put up. Uh, it's okay. We're, we're content you know, the, here. The difficulty is, there, you know, whether it's the West Coast or, go, you know, going north to south or whether it's going from west to east, there's highly variable production regions in the U.S. Right. Sort of micro regions. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, and... and you know, soybeans and corn grow where they do, cotton where it does, lettuce where it does, because it fits into the environment, the economics, you know, and all that. And so all of these different agricultural commodities have had decades and decades of plant breeding put into them to be optimized to fit where they do. Hemp has only been back, you know, back in the, in the ball game for the past few years. Right. And, and so it's been this rapid adaption, adoption of particularly uh, cannabinoid type, you know, CBD type and other cannabinoids like that, which were all very well adapted to the 45th parallel in the Pacific Northwest, you know, Northern, Northwest California, Southwest Oregon. And those are being proliferated across the US. Now there's more breeding efforts in those regions. Right. Grain is just coming in now. Right, so exactly. From Canada. You know, yeah. down from the, you know, from Manitoba, you know, into right. Montana, North Dakota. Right. Fiber types just have barely scratched the surface. Yeah, exactly. And so, right. and so the whole issue then is, you know, starting to breed varieties for not only their adaptation, but then also to meet the quality standards that say, for example, they need to go into building materials. They right. need to go into textiles. Right. You know, whatever the product may be you know, it has to all be developed. And so you have to have a starting place and that's where we're at right now. Right, right. But it, but it did make sense to me when you brought up the point that the grain takes longer to grow, that the, the optimum time to, to process the stalks is going to happen before the grain has matured completely. And so the assumption is, well, they'll work on the genetics to try to get those to be more aligned, I would yeah, imagine. You know, and, and learn to throw in at that, I don't want to diss by crop, you know, grain fiber. For herd, it may be perfectly good, but for high value textiles. Right, know, right, for the bass And so forth, yep. it probably won't cut it. Yeah, yeah, understood. But I get your point that we, A, we have to just work out what our end material is and work backward for the genetics for that. But then we also have to work within each micro region and identify what's gonna work there. And so you have many variables that have to be worked through and we're, we want it all today. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. so, 
<laughs> All right, let me go back to the questions and just sort of see, it looks like more have been popped in. Um, oh yeah, the, I'm gonna let that one go because you answered it. Um, Wait, I thought that there were others, but the, you know the issue of of testing. If if it's really we if we're really planting for fiber, the testing may be much less of an issue because we're not seeking cannabinoids, and therefore we're not running into the issue of THC. Um, Although the difficulty is is grain types. Um, it, it depends on the state laws and how they comply with federal law, but. The difficulty is they have to be tested the same as these, as uh, cannabinoid type hemp. Right. And so there, there's there's moves afoot to try to change legislation to allow. Right. That. Exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, I see another question here. Can you speak more to seed certification? Okay. Okay. Um, that that is an important point. Um, there's many types of genetics that are out there, many different varieties, and what many companies are doing is certification is a process within a state that the seed is uh, grown and multiplied and that it's it's basically certified to be true to type you know that it's hemp that it's true to its description and that it's uh, has a high germination quality and that there's no noxious weed seeds mixed with it. That's what seed certification is about. There's another process which gets into the registry of varieties and plant variety protection. And that's where the intellectual property of a company that breeds hemp varieties can seek protection of their, their property. And, and again, that helps to stimulate the marketplace and that high quality seed that's able to be just certified and described uh, can get into the marketplace. Right, right. And you actually mentioned, uh, Jeffrey, when we were prepping for this, that that uh, um, GHIC is potentially going to be getting some feminized uh, grain or fiber seeds. Yeah, we're working with a private breeder in the state of Washington, because here in Oregon, 98% of our hemp varieties that are grown are feminized, for, you know, feminized varieties, feminized plants for, produce, for producing cannabinoids. There's no pollen sure. in the system. Yeah. And that's, that's able to be a real barrier to then looking at grain types and fiber types, which are typically dioecious, have male and female plants. Mm -hmm. uh, that's going to sort out over time. You know, there's new, there's new technologies coming along called triploid varieties, which pollen is irrelevant. It doesn't, you know, it does, it's like a banana, doesn't produce seed, can't produce seed, um, and it's not affected by pollen. Um, but what we're going to do for some initial fiber work is that we're working with a private breeder in Washington who's taken an Italian fiber variety, you know, which is 12, 15 feet tall, and making feminized seed of it. So therefore, we can grow it where the cannabinoid feminized plants are and and be a good neighbor and not cause uh, pollen intrusion into uh, uh, the essential oil and the marijuana industry ecosystem right exactly wonderful okay uh, so you will begin at least at some of your regional stations starting to test for for um, fiber crop it sounds like yeah we're, we're, we're doing a little bit this year and then uh, hopefully next year much more wide ranging great um, I thank you very much. And I actually, John, I want to return to you for a moment because creep was new to me other than REO. <laughs> so um, I wanted to see what you, um, which direction does it creep? I didn't, I just can't visualize what you're even speaking of. <laughs> uh, I apologize for that. I was throwing around mechanics lingo and I, without giving you a definition. So creep is slow deformation over time. So slow if you have any kind of a material okay. and you apply a force to it, the if you're measuring the strength and the stiffness, generally you run the test and it takes five to 10 minutes to run a test. Right. But what happens if you take the same material and you apply a force to it, not enough force to break it, but enough force to bend it a little bit and then you just leave that force on it for a time. 
right. for example, the bottom block in a hempcrete wall, right. right? It's got a force on it from all the blocks above. Yep. And so is it gonna basically squish over time? And <clears throat> I haven't seen anybody look into that. I, it's probably not a problem. It's just that I haven't seen it. I don't see, I haven't seen any numbers on that. Right. Yeah. I somehow have that same feeling that it may not be a problem, but I'm certain, or I, I, I think with you, I assume no one's actually tested it yet. So it does yeah. sound like it would be a good thing to assess. I'm just double checking if we have questions that are open that have come in. There's, there's another question, which is, are there concerns with cross-pollination with CBD THC strains if industrial hemp is grown in Oregon? And I was starting to make a, a written response to that, Lorna. Yes, um, particularly in Western Oregon, um, in Western Washington, North, Northwest California, uh, there's a very large uh, uh, usable bud market, uh, usable flower market, which is smoked. And if pollen gets in there, it forms seed. And when the flower is smoked, it pops like popcorn. So oh. that, that's an undesirable trait. Uh, also, if you have extraction type varieties, you know, that are, that are chopped up and, and they extract the cannabinoids by supercritical CO2 or ethanol, uh, there's some problems with uh, the seed proteins or the carbohydrates uh, interfering with the extraction process. And so, uh -huh. uh, that's a real difficulty then, particularly in Western Oregon. As you start to get out to Central Oregon, uh, Eastern Oregon, uh, cent, uh, cent Eastern Washington, uh, much larger areas, there's not as dense uh, production of the uh, usable and extractable types. And so isolation distances probably can be established. I believe the state of Washington actually has a pinning system where all fields have to be registered and they can maintain distance between the different uh, market classes. Oh, great. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, I know. And there's been discussion. Yeah. So, right. There's many things that have to be worked out about this. I totally understand. It's been pointed out to me that more people have been adding questions at the bottom. Do we have a list of current binders? What about line types? Um, well, yeah, there's, um, <clears throat> I don't have a list. Um, probably somebody does. <laughs> somebody who's tried to buy binder. The, are there different kinds of lime? Absolutely, there are different kinds of lime. There are many different kinds of lime. And they will give you uh, different results when you use them as a binder. So you got to be careful about that. But that's, is that something that people are, I mean, I realized part of having both of you here was my sense of un, trying to understand what sorts of things are being studied. So I very much appreciated, John, what you laid out in terms of the mechanisms you have to assess, but like, are either of you aware of situations where you're studying line binders and what impact they have? I'm, I'm, I'm doing research on, on binders and there's, there's no lime in it. Oh, okay then. <laughs> <laughs> well, the lime, it's, a, it's, it's not something that people in the business talk about, or I don't hear them talk about it very much, but lime itself is, when you have a lime binder in hempcrete, it still is uh, CO2 positive. It's less, it emits less CO2 than cement for concrete. Right. But it, it still emits CO2. Yes. And so I think it's actually to say that the, the binder, the lime binder absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere, it's true. Right. But, but it but doesn't absorb as about... much as it emits when you make it. Right. It's right. just absorbing back what was already spent and expended. And so it isn't net neutral. It is only net yep. neutral when it's combined with the hemp herd and the sequestering that's going on. No, there. it is not. Uh, well, the, the overall hempcrete may be neutral or even carbon negative, but uh, because there's carbon sequestered in the hemp when you grow it. Exactly. But the exactly. binder itself a lime right. binder is never 
well, I don't know about never. A lime binder, the ones that I've looked at are positive CO2 emitters overall. Right, right. If you look, no. at, the, if you look at the whole process. Right. Okay. Un understood. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, we have a question. People are just sort of popping up, uh, like asking, well, for one thing, are you folks working with uh, the Parsons folks at the materials lab in um, back east? No, nope, but I'd be happy to. Yes, exactly. They, it's, they seems like they do great things. Greg Wilson wants to know how we can get hemp free projects to use hemp wood. What a wonderful question. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see, Wayne is now asking if you're accounting for the carbon capture in the field when grown, in the field when grown, nine to seven tons per acre estimated. So, you know, we, I think we're agree in agreement that the, the, the sequestration of the hemp plant itself is progress, but that people have also been lumping in the lime binder as also taking carbon out of the air. And that's a misnomer because that carbon was released in order to create it. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Overall, overall, hemp um, reduces carbon dioxide. Right, which is do a total life cycle. Right, right. Okay. N another question about decorticators. Do you know of any decorticators coming in either in Oregon or throughout the states? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Gina Engel is on the call, and her company is Earth Merchant, and they are currently looking at building a decortication facility in Albany, Oregon. Oh, great. Um, I don't know if she can speak up or I don't know if she's allowed yeah, to speak up. But. Yeah, I'm not sure that maybe if she wants to pop. But she gave me permission to speak she about it. She gave me it. permission to say, she gave me permission to give people that information. Wonderful. They, they will be decorticating uh, for as a business. Great, great. Okay, and any others that you know of or that is the primary That's one for... Yeah, Lorna. Morgan, that's the only one I've heard of, Jeff. Yeah, I've heard of a couple of others. Um, and particularly, I can't speak to them because there's investors that are looking into opportunities to actually build supply chains. Oh, I see. It's not, okay. it's not just an issue of the decorticator, but it's also that being tied to their manufacturing process. Um, Again, I think the economy the past year or so really slowed things down. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, and Gina just posted earthmerchant.com for Oregon and Tennessee. Um, so I'm going to try to keep going because I know I'm keeping you past your time. Is there herd out there now? Can Who can I contact to purchase construction grade herd? Um, not from within the US. So basically you're still gonna be importing it is my, my understanding. Is that yours? Yeah. No, there are people selling. There are people selling her. Yeah. There but, is also- but it's hard to know what you're, it's hard to know what you're getting. Is there not, I'm sorry, Jeff. No. It's hard to know what you're getting because there aren't specifications. Yeah. There's also, um, there was a news release recently about in, um, in Montana, IND hemp. Yes. Uh, it's a very large uh, hemp grain and they are putting a decortication facility. So. Um, right. Right, they hope to have it up by the, by I think by the end of this growing season. Yes, and uh, five ton an hour is yeah. so. You know, Lorna, I'd make another, just a kind of a general comment. Um, there's, uh, I don't know if you attended our, uh, with the National Academies of Science, the, uh, uh, the hemp, National Hemp Symposium that we hosted back in February. Yes. And um, Flexform Technologies, um, the speaker, the, I can't remember what Greg's last name is. Uh, he was the speaker from Flexform Technologies in Indiana. And he's a supplier of major composite panels, bio-based panels to all the leading man, automobile manufacturers around the world. Right. He would love to use domestic hemp in his process, but 
it can but he but he can't get a first of all there's no supply and the point is is that the quality and the price point would right. have to compete with indonesian jute which oh. is another bio-based fiber right i remember this piece yeah and that we can't be predictable yet which is the other piece that even if we get some out you know like we're just going to have to build that infrastructure yeah, as John said, it's a real supply chain issue, you know, and, yes. and there's and there's multiple chicken and eggs all the way around the thing. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, there there are a couple of questions here about um, uh, let's see. I saw one about can you get lime from seawater? Oh, I hadn't even I'm, heard that. I'm not familiar with getting lime from seawater. There is a company that is getting um, lime from oyster shells, mollusk shells. Right. And you can also substitute magnesium for calcium in the lime, and you can extract magnesium from the ocean uh, without the without the CO2 issue. But I'm, I haven't investigated to see how large uh, production is available. Right, what kind of scale? Or I what the price is. Uh, I haven't investigated that. My right. research is going in a different direction. I see. Um, one question here. Do you think hemp blocks or bricks are a better alternative to the housing, less variance in materials? Have you done any exploration of, with those? Some people think yes. Some people think it doesn't matter. Some people think no. So it's Right, it depends right. On, and it probably uh, depends on what you're building. Sure. Uh, have you guys heard about a hempcrete house that's going to be built in Bend in 2021? Or actually 2022? Any, any scuttlebutt about a hempcrete house being built? I No, but I, I think we're going to be seeing lots of hempcrete houses come up in Oregon and all over the place. I hope um, so. <laughs> And Kathy also said she heard at a conference that some strains of hemp could sequester 15 times more carbon. So the genetics are obviously important, but have you heard about higher levels of sequestration in, in the different hemp? You know what Do I you would, want to speak to that. Yeah, I would yeah. say, you know, Lorna, I don't I haven't done a literature review. I would go on to Google Scholar. Right. And, and see what publications come out or have been out. Um, you know, there's there's some work that's been done for decades, you know, particularly in Europe. Yeah. Uh, I would take a look at that. But that seems like a huge, you know, X scale. Boy, you know, I mean, it, you know, and a lot of it gets to be, well, how big is it? How much water did it take? How much nitrogen did it take? You know, what's the full life cycle analysis on it? Right. Um, and we haven't you know, done any of those yet. Yeah. Well, I, I don't want to say nothing's been done because I know that Europeans have done stuff. I think there's been a little bit done work in the United States. But again, it takes real systematic research, you know, very. And again, that we don't have to invent the technology for doing that. You know, that's this, these procedures have been worked out just right. like, you know, hemp standard certification methods, you know, there's right. one of the methods for it. But, yeah. I, but I would take a look at the literature, particularly looking through Google search, Google, Google, Scholar. Google research. Yeah. And, and actually, Jeffrey, if I can stay on the same, because someone, Lori asked the question asking about, because we were going down the rabbit hole of carbon sequestration and the lime versus the herd, um, is there clear data available on carbon sequestration? She can't find any solid research, which upholds the numbers that have been quoted for carbon capture per acre. Um, do you have recommendations about where to find that? Google Scholar. Hallelujah. Well, okay. Send, send me an email there. I just I just found a study from Australia a little while ago that where it's, it was done correctly. Beautiful. And also, I would say that the fifteen times is, is I'm guessing, but I think the fifteen times is probably the difference per acre, not per plant, right? Right. Per of course. Acre no, it said CBD per acre. Yeah, between CBD and, and uh, fiber. Oh, you're just thinking it right, of course, because the stocks are significantly different, right, and more scale. You're growing, right. you grow more bi biomass per acre. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, that would make sense. Thank you for that, makes perfect sense to me. Okay. So I'm trying to see if there are other questions that I have missed. Um, uh, 
I don't know. I'm not seeing anything right now. Okay, I'm I'm gonna get out of the QA for a second. I should have marked them as answered like a smart person. <laughs> Um, oh, and someone is someone named Wayne is suggesting that Dr. Peter Schwartz at Cal Poly SLO knows the carbon capture numbers. Um, Wayne wants to know if it's a myth that hemp can remediate um, radiation, such as Chernobyl. It's 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 a very good uh, uptake. Uh, taker up of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, nutrients in the soil. I've heard reports, you know, that it was part of the remediation at uh, taking up nucleotides, you know, at Chernobyl. Um, but again, there's just not good solid work, you know, heavy metals, all this. I, I, there's no question that it, it can take, differentially take up certain, uh, 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 you know, certain, certain uh, nutrients. But um, again, we'd have to take a look at the literature, what the specifics are. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, all right. Um, I think uh, people are answering back and forth in here. Bricks have thermal bridging problems, uh, says D. Uh, Lori says you can check out some of the research done in Europe. Companies like Tradical have excellent technical sheets and include the data on sequestration. Um, so there's that. And then Maria wanted to become, uh, to know about um, your research team. Uh, and, but sh she's in the Midwest. So someone here from USHBA answered her, University of Illinois and Philip Alberta's, Alberti's work. Okay, so I think that we have caught up with the questions. Does, does do either of you have any closing thoughts? I, I've kept you past the time you had offered. Um, We're glad there's questions. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, yeah. this has been wonderful. Uh, yes. So yes, I thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I wanted to actually just sort of invite everyone to join USH the, uh, the Oregon and, um, sorry, the <laughs> U.S. Hemp Building Association. Uh, and so we'll just take a moment and then let everyone leave that how to get involved, become a USHBA member. The basic membership is $99 a, a year. Uh, there's a $49 rate for grad students and uh, there, are, there are scholarships for BIPOC folks, et cetera. So, we don't want that to be a bar to entry. Um, get involved in your regional hub. Donate to the foundation to expedite this ASTM ICC certification that we were speaking about toward hemp and all biomass. Um, bring a friend and a colleague to the next meeting. Spread the word. Uh, the USHBA does have an events calendar. Uh, and then engaging with a USHBA committee if you do join us. And what are they, you ask? And the answer is that we have a set of different committees because as I said, we've got the metaphor of moving many balls toward the goalposts. We have committees for certification because that will really help us scale education to have you know, uniformity of message. Uh, regional leadership, there are some regions that don't have any representation at all. Uh, so if you're drawn to it, we'd love to have you see whether or not there's need in your area. Supply chain, as both of our guests have spoken about, materials, which is a big, vast thing and which uh, the past president of USHBA is uh, keen to start exploring. Government relations and permitting. Communities of color is a really vibrant um, part of our organization and our commitment to that and events. Uh, so all of these are, are committees that you could join to bring your expertise and volunteer. And our final slide is that there's info at ushba.org if you have questions and the benefits of membership other than meeting fabulous people and doing great work is accessing a monthly newsletters, educational videos and articles, being in the membership directory, networking with others, uh, we have USHBA events and soon actually 
concurrently, I believe there's an event happening in, uh, in Florida right now, and you can have access to the USHBA logo and merchant discount, discounts, merchandise discounts. So again, I really want to thank you, Jeffrey and John, for giving us so much information and such a great presentation and for giving us an hour and a half of your evening. So um, thank you again for um, being willing to be here. And it was just such a great presentation. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Bye.